Howdy, everybody. How is it going tonight? Welcome to John Ferrian Live. This is another awesome episode right here, right now, for you. We have Jack Simons on. He's coming into us live from the Middle East. This is a first, folks. We've never, ever had somebody come in from literally the other side of the planet. So I'm trying to think. We've had Canadian guests. We've had U.S. guests. We've had every time zone covered. I've done Eastern time zone, Western time zone, you know, Pacific time zone, Mountain time zone, Central time zone. But I've never done the Middle Eastern time zone. This is a first. It's actually morning over there right now, guys. It's 6 a.m. live from the Middle East. I'm going to be bringing you Jack Simons. He's a Air Force firefighter. He's a I can't say the word on the air. He's a bad bleep sledder. He's an awesome dude. You're going to love him. He's going to have a great time here. We got Tia Smith watching from Santa Barbara. We've got David Wagner coming in from California. Mr. Patrick Fines from Edmonton. Mr. Bill Yeager from right here in Washington. We've got everybody rolling in. You guys know the routine. We'll drop it in the comments. Let us know where you're watching from and maybe what you did this weekend. I was out in the boat this morning. We took uh, some friends. We went down to uh, Lake Washington between Bellevue and Seattle, and we went. You literally water skied to breakfast. I didn't. I recorded the guy water skiing, my buddy. And then we went over and had an amazing breakfast, cruised around Lake Union, saw downtown Seattle from the water, and uh, just chilled on the water all day. It was pretty amazing. If you look close, you can even see the, the suntan, land, suntan lines from my sunglasses, little, little rosy cheeks here going on. But that's not what the show's about. Not about my weekend. It's about you guys and your weekend. About Jack. So lot, drop it in there. Let us know what you did this weekend. Let us know what you're, where you're watching from. If you've never seen John Ferrian live before, you're in for a treat. This is all about snowmobiling, safety, education, positive growth of the sport. And we come to you every single week on Sunday night. 7 p.m. Pacific time is typically when we're on. And we bring you amazing guests from all over the world. Uh, literally this time, we got folks from all over the world. So one thing I want to remind you of is if you share the show and you watch the show, you are automatically in to win some amazing prizes every week. We usually have Woody's Racing on off weeks. The other weeks we have uh, Fly Racing Snow. And we got another show here where we're going to be giving away the Fly Racing Socks. So again, we're going to be giving away for this four pairs of Fly Racing Socks ready for you guys if you share this out and get part of it. So let me drop the uh, Fly Racing Snow giveaway down. I want to tell you a little bit about this. Live Large University, guys, this is about to blow up. I can't tell you yet what's going on, but let me tell you right now, I am planning a very, 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 very special episode with a giant announcement for all of you guys on Monday night, August 31st. I don't have the exact time dialed in yet. I'm pretty sure it'll stay at 7 p.m. Pacific time, but I'm going to have three guests on. There's going to be four of us on if we do this right. Fingers crossed I can get everybody tied, their schedules all together, but the largest announcement ever for Live Large University and the John Farian Live charity with Airy. we're doing the Avalanche Education Scholarships. You can go to John Farian Live, or it's actually Live Large Item Order dot sale is the website. I'll drop that in the comments a little bit later. But you guys can go in there and order your shirts, and all the proceeds go to the Live Large University Scholarship Program to advance motorized education for backcountry snowmobilers and snow bikers. So we're going to drop that down. So this is one of the logos that's on there is the Live Large University shirt. And then, of course, this is the hat logo. So the JFL with Live Large underneath it um, will be a hat logo that we have as well that's coming on. And so, again, September 1st, we're kicking something big off. We're going to announce it the 31st tune back in for that. I can't wait to get that out in front of all of you guys. So I'm going to be bringing Jack up here in three, two, and one. How are you doing, sir? Morning, John. How are you? I was just joking with you a few minutes on the phone. And I'm saying like, you know what? I feel like Robin Williams in the you know Good Morning Vietnam movie where he says, good morning, Vietnam, right? Like, but you're not in Vietnam. You're in the Middle East, but it kind of feels yeah. the same. It's still morning. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. So uh, 
Jack, let's uh, share with these folks how you and I got introduced. My recollection was you had reached out to me a few times, and we had chatted back and forth, and then you, you worked up the courage to say, hey, let's, let's get on the show together and do something exciting. So w- tell me a little bit about that, though. What was, from your perspective, what drew you to the show? What drew you to reach out to me and to, to now be here today? Yeah, so I mean, I've been following the show for a, for a while. It's been uh, awesome to watch it grow. And then uh, was it about a half a month ago or so you had uh, Aaron on and I listened to his story yep. and that kind of gave me the courage, you know, to reach out and be like, Hey, I feel like we could do something together here as well. So I'm glad yeah, you talked out. Yeah, you're talking about the show with Aaron McCarthy and Dan Adams. Is that the one you're talking yes, about? Sir. From a couple, yeah, a couple of weeks ago. Um, that was a super powerful story. And uh, for those who haven't watched it yet, go back and watch it. Uh, the premise of the show is uh, Aaron McCarthy is a uh, disabled veteran um, who was injured in the Iraqi War and uh, suffered from some serious injuries as well as some PTSD. Um, and a lot of that story, a lot of that message, really hit home for you. So, oop, are you still there, or did I lose lose you? Let's just give it a second here. Jack froze up on me, guys. Let's give it just a second, see if I can get him back on. Establishing a new network connection. One more time. There we go. All right, are you back? Back, Yes, sir. Awesome, awesome. So, hey, guess what? The internet connection between me and you is not perfect. Big surprise, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, was, uh, yeah, I don't know how many... Uh... How many times we've uh, tried to test the connection and we've had good luck and then as yeah. soon as we go live, it cuts out. Yeah, no That's sweat. The cool part about the software that I use, though, is that uh, it keeps my connection live out with uh, Facebook still alive. And so even if you and I get disconnected over our Skype call that we're doing, um, it still allows me to continue the show on and we get you reconnected. So it's, kind of, it's not a huge deal at all. So no biggie. Perfect. Yeah, but so you and you and Aaron, as I was telling the audience, is uh, you, you know that story of Aaron's brought a lot of emotions and feelings and memories of your own experience that brought you to where you are today. That um, you felt like there was enough parallels, but also enough uniqueness to your story that uh, we would get on and, and chat about it as well here. So I really appreciate you reaching out and, and coming on. I appreciate you having me on. Got to admit, though, I'm a little jealous of listening about your day today. <laughs> oh, what oh, you didn't sound, uh, sounds like a yeah. nice day. So you're saying you didn't have an opportunity in the Middle East to just go cruise around on a boat, go lake, go water skiing, have a beautiful breakfast, and see the Seattle, the Seattle skyline? That didn't that wasn't an option yeah, for you? No, no, I didn't have that experience today. Well, I tell you what, buddy, uh, serving our country to allow guys like me to go out and screw off all day like that is what it's all about. And so I, I'm thankful for guys like you that uh, you know put your your life on the line, put your you know sacrifices that are out there. Um, in all branches of military, you know, to, to serve our country and especially in the world that we're in right now, Jack, is there's there's so many people out there that uh, don't get it and don't understand, you know, the sacrifices that you guys make for the benefits that they and frankly, they don't even understand the own benefits that they have. Right. It's like this this idea right. idea of like, you know, everybody is owed the world and nobody needs to take any sacrifices. Right. And so, you know, I, I can tell you from my heart and soul, you know, thank you for your service and anybody out there who's watching any of you that are doing military service. Like I've got the utmost respect for all of you guys so, and gals, obviously. So well, thanks, sir. Yeah. So let's go back and uh, let's just get to know you a little bit. So let's start out. You, my, my memory tells me that uh, you and you started out in Maine. This so let's let's start at the beginning. Are you there? There's your connection killing you again. I can still see you. I can still hear you. Jack, can you hear me? You there, buddy? Can you wave at me? Can you see me? Can you hear me? All right. So, guys, I'm going to drop Jack, and I'm going to bring him back on. Can you hear me, Jack, or no? Yeah, I'm back now. Okay. We're just going to keep rolling with it, buddy. If that happens, and if it gets really bad, just know that in advance what I might do is kill our call, and we'll just reboot from the beginning, right? I'll keep rolling with the show, but uh, yes, if, we get a, if we get a bad connection there, no, bi- no big deal. So um, we could see you the whole time for what it's worth. I'm just uh, not sure okay. why you couldn't see us. So the, uh, yeah, it just froze up. I still was con- like, I saw a cute Wi-Fi connection, uh, but the connection on the Skype was lost. So Yeah, no, no worries. Um, so you started out in Maine. So let's just start at the beginning. You know, you grew up in Maine. You started riding. Like, just give us some background on, on who's Jack Simons and kind of where you began. 
Yeah, so I grew up a uh, small town, Acton, Maine, a uh, town of not much more than probably maybe even 3,000 people now, but okay, seemed a lot smaller even then. Um, lived there, grew up there. It's a type of town where you could uh, drive your four-wheeler four -wheeler to school. That's awesome. I even had a teacher that would ride his, uh, his snowmobile to school in the wintertime. So uh, born and raised there. Uh, didn't get into too much snowmobiling. At that, that, at that point in life, I was uh, focused a lot on uh, snowboarding. Okay. And uh, spent a lot of time in the mountains doing that growing up. And uh, in 2004, I even did a X Games qualifier. Wow. Um, didn't make it very far, but yeah. hey, I tried anyways, right? <laughs> Got to chase so, the dream. Got to chase the dream, right? <laughs> absolutely. Yep. And then, uh, yeah, so I didn't get into the snowmobiling until a little bit later in life, uh, probably around 21, 22 years old. Okay. Really? I mean, we had, uh, we had a couple of snowmobiles when I was a kid. We had a, an old like 70s moto ski. Okay. And once we got it started, we'd ride it all day until it ran out of gas around the yard. But that was about the extent of it. Yeah. So. Very nice. Very nice. So you grew up in. You grew, and then, uh, you know, okay. then we get into the, uh, at that point, do the, the military thing, right? So I enlisted in the military and uh, there's a long story there how I ended up getting to Mountain Home. And I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit more in the show here. Yeah, sounds good. So you uh, just confirm you can still hear me okay, right? Give me a thumbs up. All right, cool. You're good. Um, and so uh, it sounds like you grew up in a family of, you know, people who were into sports, right? Like, you know, snowmobiling was a part of your family growing up. So, you know, snow mountain boarding, you know, I'm sorry, snowboarding and, and all those type of things were going on too. So where, did you travel out west to snowboard from Maine or did you snowboard out in Maine and you did you mostly do it out there? Yeah, I was always the, uh, I never even left the East Coast really until uh, pretty much after high school, like okay. the Northeast. Okay. So, and then, uh, first, first adventure West was, uh, in a U-Haul truck. Headed to Idaho. <laughs> there you go. And we'll get to that in just a minute when you decide to join the military. But, uh, one of the things you shared with me, that's been a really important part of your life is that, uh, you know, you were inspired to serve your community at a pretty early age. Um, and your first step in doing so was as a firefighter. So tell me what the interest in firefighting was. Was it a family thing? Was it somebody else, you know, uncle, your dad, or somebody that was involved in it? Um, but, but let's go into some detail now around how you got into firefighting and maybe some of your early experiences in firefighting. And it sounds like late teens, early 20s even, you got involved, right? Yeah, so I mean, really, it goes back to when I was probably three years old. My, uh, okay. At that point in time, my old, my old man got involved in the volunteer fire department in the town. So from that point on, I was kind of born and raised in the uh, in the firehouse per se. Okay. So uh, at 16 is when I was finally able to participate. Uh, got my EMT license at 16. Started wow. riding the ambulance at 16, and then um, at 18 is when I could finally go to a uh, fire tax school. So I did that at 18, and then um, did that for a couple of years, and that's uh, what filled up my time between high school and the military. Yeah, and so between high school and military, you were in your late teens, kind of early, you know, late teens. You started at 16, and kind of by the time you're 18, you were pretty much fully into it. Um, is this something you knew, like, early on that this was your career path? Like, that kind of was something that just was, in your mind, already decided at a pretty early age? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, there's a lot of kids uh, that always say they want to be firefighters, but that was uh, my, really my only ambition to do growing up was to do that, so... That's awesome. And so it sounds like, you know, your dad was, it was your dad a firefighter as well too then? I think I heard that yeah, right. Yeah, so he was yeah. a volunteer firefighter. He was also uh, in the Air Force okay. um, from the time I was born. So so military and firefighting at the right from the beginning. But uh, let's talk about it. You know, 16, 18 years old, you're full-fledged now involved in firefighting. And, uh, you know, something that I think all of us take for granted is, you know, no different than the military, you know, serving your country, um, you're, you're experiencing a lot of things that, most of the rest of society doesn't experience when it comes to loss. Maybe it's people you know, maybe it's not people you know, but, you know, the loss of property, the loss of life, uh, you know, people being injured, you being there to help and save and rescue. Um, you know, is, is there any early parts of that firefighting career that stood out as, a, as something that really shaped you and, in, in, you know, you continue to inspire you to firefight, you know, maybe a specific type of a scenario or situation that happened that, you know, just pushed you harder to do it. But then also in hindsight, maybe just molded you into the guy you are today and, you know, go from there. Like, it's kind of open book, but like just what has yeah, firefighting yeah, done done for you in your life, you know, maybe positive and or negative that's kind of brought you to where you are today? 
Yeah, I think uh, one of the biggest push uh, for me personally for the fire thing was uh, was 9-11. Uh, I was in high school when it happened. And then uh, at that point on, I knew like I was going to do firefighting. That was going to be what I wanted to do in life. So that's that was my gave me the uh, ambition to push forward. And I did EMT basically night school while I was in high school. So I got that completed. And then uh, I don't I think there was a lot of situations, a lot of things that came up. Uh, during the younger years of doing EMS and fire that I didn't really pay attention much to until later in life mm -hmm. and you know and, and things started coming back and you start looking back and realizing how things at a younger age shaped who you were yeah and we'll so, get you know once we kind of walk next through kind of your transition in the military and kind of your years of experience there um, there were some things you shared with me in in our phone call that uh, were important about you know how your life was impacted you know maybe it's relationships or maybe how you deal with things and stress and you know those type of things we'll get into that too but uh, you know so you spent a few years in Maine as a firefighter you know anything there you want to highlight and then ultimately what triggered you to then pursue military firefighting um it sounds like in the air force right from the beginning but let's just talk us through that transition yeah so what had happened is uh coming out of high school kind of the uh the post 9 11 era there uh about the time i was ready to start applying for the full-time city fire jobs uh there was a lot of uh vets coming back um that had enlisted right after 9 11 and they were uh getting you know veterans preference points on civil service tests for fire jobs and uh, I kept applying and they kept uh, and they kept getting the jobs. And I said, if I can't beat them, I'll join them. So that was my uh, one day just kind of clicked. And I was like, I'm going to listen to the Air Force. And the only thing I want to do is firefighting. And my initial plan was to uh, basically do my time and then move back to the East Coast. Um, that was until I got to the West Coast. <laughs> and there you go. <laughs> and that was part of the journey as well, too, right? It's so, uh, you know, how early was it in your, your military career that you picked like you talked to me about them on the phone too like yeah, yeah. let's talk about how that happened like okay you're you maybe just went through i don't know i don't want to put words in your mouth but maybe you just went through basic they ask you where you want to go to and it's not real common that people get to go where they want but in your case that's maybe how it worked out but talk yeah, us through so that cool. that process and how that worked out yeah so going through basic training i think it's uh just something kind of build up a little uh, morale they let you make a wish list of where you want to go yeah and i think it's just kind of uh a time during basic where you can think for yourself for the first time in a few yeah. weeks yep. and you can put down a list of bases and uh, I had put mountain home, um, mountain home, Idaho, what, right. That was my old man's first base. And I was like, Oh, I'm going to try mountain home. And that was the first thing on my list. And then, uh, after basic training and getting to tech school for about a month, I found out that I'm going to go to mountain home. So the wish list actually worked for me. That's awesome. And so it's, it's the irony is, is sometimes us crazy snowmobilers, our desirable places we want to go to is the opposite places that everybody else wants to go to. You probably have yeah. Air Force firefighters who are saying like, I want to go to Hawaii or I want to go to, you know, Florida or Texas or somewhere. Right. And you're like, I want to go to the middle of nowhere in Idaho. And everybody's like, yeah, sure. We'll send them. Right. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I think, I think back correctly, my second choice was Fairchild, which okay. is kind of up near your neck of the woods, I think. Yep. Nice. Nice. So uh, you ended up out in uh, Mountain Home, Idaho, of course, and uh, yep. that's about the time that you discovered mountain riding, mountain sledding? Yeah, so I moved uh, to the West Coast with two trail sleds and uh, kind of rode those around for a couple years, just kind of on and off the groom parts of the trail. Mm -hmm. And then it was about 2013, maybe 2012, around there. At uh, that point, myself, uh, myself and uh, my wife at the time decided that we're, we're staying here. We're staying in Idaho. I fell in love with it. We both fell in yeah. love with it. Yeah. Um, just the uh, basically having access to public land, and then the, in the mountains. Yeah. So and it was at that point when we made that decision that uh, my family started following us out west. Okay. And as did as did her family. So now we've got a bunch of us living out there. So <laughs> that's awesome. Got the the main transplants out to Idaho. So well, the the one thing you have in common, you know what it is between Maine and Idaho, right? What's that? Oh, come on. Potatoes? Potatoes, yes, sir, <laughs> and snowmobiling, of course. But Idaho potatoes yeah. uh, and Maine potatoes—that's one of the things that uh, you know. At least coming from Minnesota, I always heard about the the Idaho potatoes. That was kind of in the the new, you know, whatever in the marketing and the ads and stuff. And I didn't realize until I lived out in New Hampshire for a couple of years myself that uh, Maine is like a giant producer of potatoes up there as well. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, fun fact. Just saying. <laughs> 
Um, and so let's reflect back then, you know, I mean, your, your firefighting career obviously, um, you know, went from kind of private firefighting up in Maine, you went into the, the air force, you transitioned there, you know, it sounds like at some point in there, you got married and started having kids, right? Yeah, and, absolutely. And, and you fast forward to kind of today, you know, how many times have you been then deployed like outside of Idaho? Like, is this your first and only time or have you gone multiple no, so times? Uh, this is my second six month tour. Okay. So um, I've, I've done some, I've done some smaller stuff around, uh, basically CONUS and then up to Alaska. Last year I spent a month in Alaska in a village, yeah. uh, called Matarvik, which is way out on the West coast of Alaska. Okay. So I went up there on a medic tasking for a month last year. So, yeah, yeah, no, I hear you. And, um, you know, I've got, you know, over time, my lifetime as well too, I've had, you know, different friends on and off and, uh, you know, some have been firefighters and first responders, you know, EMS type, you know, individuals as well. And, uh, you know, one thing I can tell you from my own personal experience with those folks is that uh, I think you referenced it earlier is like it's not always obvious to them that the way they manage dealing with stress and quote unquote problems or issues can become a little bit different. Like what I've witnessed personally is that, uh, you know, there can be a level of what you call like compartmentalization, right? Like we're, mm -hmm. you know, this is bad. I'm going to box it up and deal with it over here. Right. And it's not something where we're always readily right up front, just acknowledging and addressing issues because in our mind, you know, that stress, that problem might be part of our day job and it's there. So I don't know if, if that's, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I know those are some of the things that I've witnessed and experienced with folks who are firefighters, you know, EMS people, um, and you know, between your firefighting days and your stuff there too, you had shared with me that, you know, it's created some issues in your life that in hindsight yeah. you kind of maybe are looking back at, but you know, just go into it as much as you can. And I really want you to use your, your thoughts and your words to kind of express this and go into a little bit of detail there of, you know, what, what do you call it? I mean, do you, would you call it PTSD? Is it something else? Is it, you know, and how has it affected your life? Yeah. I mean, I honestly, I think it's, we've gotten to the point now in society where we can call it PTSD. Yeah. Um, you don't want to take anything away from any uh, combat vets obviously, sure. but it's, uh, it's a very similar uh, experience and it's, um, you kind of deal with it the same way you compartmentalize it and you can store it away for a long time. Yeah. And then, uh, but once that stuff kind of builds up at some point, it's going to come out. Yeah. Uh, and for me that came out, uh, 2018 was kind of like when it all kind of compiled out, you know, com uh, piled up enough to where I had a, m a moment where I was like, I need help. And I was thankful that I had the resources in Boise. I went to the Boise VA. Yeah. Uh, I'm never going to forget the day I walked in and asked to talk to a counselor. It's not something I would ever really, I never saw myself doing that. Yeah. So, uh, that was a big, that was a big turning point for me. And I learned a lot more about myself and it really brought me back to, you know, the early days of my uh, firefighting career and where certain situations were, I should have talked about it more then and didn't. Yeah. Yeah. And then it kind of built up for a while. And then, uh, once stuff gets built up, it only takes something pretty small to, uh, to trigger, um, something like that where I'm, I'm walking into the VA and asking for help. So, yeah, well, and here's the thing that, uh, you know, here's the thing, like a lot of people, I think society in general, less today than it ever has been, but there has in historically over time through all of you in my lifetime, there's always been a stigma about, you know, seeing a counselor like, oh man, mm -hmm. that person, you know, needs counselor. They need help. They're, you know, quote, quote unquote, they're crazy. Right. Kind of thing. Right. If they're going to a counselor and, you know, I've shared this publicly on my show a number of times and I'll say it again, just for anybody who has maybe need it. But like at 10 years old, I had a sister who took her own life. Right. And at a very, very early age, I experienced some dramatic trauma in my life, right? That I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I don't know even, I'm 10 years old. Like you don't even know how to deal with it at that age. And, you know, I experienced going to a counselor for a while, like a little while. And, uh, you know, what I learned through that process and especially in hindsight now at 46 years old today, you know, not today, but this, this year I'll be 46 years old, looking back at my life and kind of the experiences that I've had with that kind of stuff is, you know, a good counselor, is really all they're doing is they're getting you to think through your problems. Yeah, they're correct. not, they're not there telling you, Oh yeah, Jack, this is what's wrong with you. This is what you need to do. Here's your prescription. You're out the door, right? Like that's not what it's about, right? It's about just getting you to think through things and to process things into mm -hmm. kind of, you know, it's almost, it's literally you're helping yourself. 
but what right. they're do what they're doing is they're pulling it out of you, right? Like they're getting you to consider Jack or John, you know, maybe this is something that you've experienced in your life and you talk about it. And as you talk about it, you start realizing like, man, like that happens to other people too. And like, like I'm not the only one that's experiencing this. And, you know, we learn really quickly that, you know, we're not alone in this world when we've gone through issues. And, you know, one of the things and one of the things that really inspires me to do these shows every week is that concept of everybody has a story. You know, Jack, whether right. it's you or anybody who's watching this show right now, I guarantee you if you look at yourself in the mirror and you ask yourself this question, what's my story? You've got one, right? There's something that's happened in our lives, all of us. You know, it could have been divorce. It could have been a death in our family. You know, for you, you're, you're firefighting and the experiences you had at a very young, impressionable age in your late teens and early 20s. Like, that's the stuff that changes our lives and we don't really realize it and think about it in hindsight until, you know, here we are years later now, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was almost, I don't know how many years, a handful of years later until it all yeah. started to come back up for sure. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and, and I look at this as like, you know, hey, you're a pro writer, you're an Air Force guy, you're like, you're about, I mean, I'll just say it, you're about as badass of a guy as I would know walking down the street, you know, and yet here you are dealing with these things in our lives that frankly, many, many of us deal with. And the difference with you is you've seek the help, you found the help, and you're willing to now share your experience to come out and try to help others, right? Yeah, and I mean, part of it's also, you know, finding something in life that you're passionate about to, uh, to you know, really focus on. And uh, that, that helps out huge for me. Yeah, no, that's awesome. So. so as you look back at, you know, the the history of the firefighting and the military and even to where you're at today in your life experiences, is there anything there we want to still go deeper into or discuss or visit about before we go maybe more into, we'll kind of rewind a little bit and we'll go back into kind of your, your snowmobile professional career with some of your sponsors, some of the filming you've done, some of the other epic things you've done, but I don't want to pass on this opportunity to, to make a difference in the world with your story. So, um, I think we might get back into some of it through, through the snowmobile side and uh, tie it back over there. Okay. But, uh, Okay, so let's go back then to that moment when you decided to sign up for the military. You moved to Mountain Home, Idaho, and you know you found yourself in the mountains on trail sleds. Let's start there, and then yeah. just take take us from there and keep keep going and see where that devolves to. Yeah, so like I said, I got to Mountain Home, and that first winter was just on a, a couple of Yamaha phasers. Nice. At that, so um, they were the newer style. Um, so yeah, just sticking to the groomed trails and started riding in the trendies here and there uh at that point my in my military career i was still pretty new so the uh the income didn't uh wasn't going to get me on a, a bigger mountain sled at the time so i made the best of the situation i had and we sure had a lot of good times on those uh on those sleds for sure yeah i even got my mom uh she came out to visit a few times before she moved out and i even got her out there on the mountains and got her up to the top of the trinities on a trail sled so awesome but, stuff Awesome stuff. So you obviously eventually uh, transitioned out of the mountain sled or out of the trail sleds into mountain sleds. And, and, and what was, what was that? Like, you know, what was that defining moment when you decided to kind of evolve forward into a legit mountain sleds? Oh, uh, I just got tired of the trail to be honest. And you, see, <laughs> you see the track just disappearing. And then in uh, 2013, a buddy of mine basically lent me a sled for the winter. Okay. And it was at that point, it was a 20, I think it was like a 2000, maybe 11 or 12 skidoo 800 163 and i was like man you know, my world's changed at that point i can't ever go back to the trail sled so no nope, exactly uh, that next spring uh, i traded in the motorcycle i had for uh for an articat m8000 at the time of 2014 okay and uh i kept that sled for a long time and that sled and the things i did a lot on that sled really pushed me to where i'm at today uh, like you, you saw the video of one of the rebuilds I sent you with my kiddo yeah, yeah. doing that lapse video. So that was all with that snowmobile. Yeah. And so at some, at some point along the way too, you decided to pick up a, a video camera, right? And started filming a lot of your backcountry riding and terrain and, you know, who was kind of your partner or partners in crime, yeah. um, with, with that and talk a little bit about some of the backcountry filming that you did. Yeah. So starting, starting in like 2013 ish. Uh, we started doing, you know, stuff on cell phones, recording stuff on cell phones. Uh, yeah. My riding buddy, uh, Joey Skogan, uh, we started riding together. He was going to uh, BSU there in Boise while I was doing the, uh, the military thing. We kind of hooked up on 
on Facebook one day and he's like, let's go ride together. And we did. And so we, that's when we kind of started filming. And then after my last deployment, I had, uh, gotten in touch with Joe Gill mm -hmm. with high country octane. And at that point they were working on a project. So sled diction five. Okay. So I got the, uh, I got to see an early premiere as they're finishing up editing of that. And I was like, this is not only is this what I want to do, but these are the type of guys that I want to ride with and, and film yeah. with. Yeah. Um, so moving forward into the next, uh, the next winter, uh, Joe started working on the sled diction six film. And that's when I started getting into, uh, the filming and even getting in front of the camera a few times. And that was the, uh, that was the start. There you go. And so that's and, something I just want to give a quick shout out to, to Joe Gill. I know he watches a lot of these shows. He's actually been a guest on the show before. And, uh, you know, something I really respect about Joe is a couple of things, right, is, you know, first of all, his, his affinity for old iron, right? Like he's the guy that he's proud to say he doesn't need the latest and greatest machine to go out there and just kick butt and have some fun, which has been real inspirational for think about guys like you who started out on maybe some older and iron compared to the latest, mm -hmm. greatest machines that were out there. And then at the same time, he was one of those guys too that he really reached out into the sled community and encouraged random Joe riders out there, you know, or Jack riders in your case, Jack Simons here, um, to supply and submit content from all around the country over the years and kind of build this almost like a national team of filmers, right? Versus the traditional thought is like, okay, a crew of guys all get together. They all go to the back country together and they all film together and they're all together, together, together. Right. But right. Joe's thing is more of a compilation of many writers from around the country, all filmed by different people. And then Joe ultimately went back and would edit it and kind of make the final product out there too. And it was really cool to see what he's done in the industry and the impression he's made. And I think Jack, you've seen as well too, is, uh, Joe is going to be riding a new Skidoo 850 this next yeah, season. Exactly. So he, he's finally jumping off the old iron and coming in with the big dogs. So we'll see what he's all up about then. So, Yeah, that's, uh, that's going to be a good change, big change for him. Very interested to see. And uh, we've talked about getting together this winter for uh, some riding down there in California. So we'll see if we can make it happen. That's awesome. And so you were going into, uh, you know, that's when filming really ramped up for you too. And so maybe you have a couple of, you know, experiences or stories you want to talk about in some of your, your more intense filming days of things that you accomplished or that you're really proud of that you were able to submit and get, get out, you know, get aired out with, uh, Joe. Yeah. So I had, uh, my, my first like re-entry, right. That came, that was a big thing yep. a few years back. So I, I did my first one in slot edition six. Um, which is probably, I mean, I tried it 15 times probably that day before yep. I made it happen. Yep. So like, uh, I go back and watch it now. I'm like, it, it doesn't <laughs> look that impressive now, but it sure felt impressive at the time. Yeah, no, I hear you. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's amazing what a good camera, a camera angle will do for you. Yeah. I mean, it's, I think you and I were laughing about that on the phone earlier this week is that, uh, you know, I, I, I fancy myself a, a I'll call it a good writer, not a great writer, but a pretty good writer. But I fancy myself equally as good or better as a photographer or a filmer. And so I'm constantly like getting really cool shots of friends and family and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, as the guy who also wants to get some great shots of myself, I always struggle with like, man, I need a good camera guy. And like, there's always one or two rides a year locally here with a good photographer that I go out with and I take full advantage of it. I just kind of turn into a giant monkey inside of a cage and, you know, start bouncing all over the place and, you know, re-entries, jumps, drops, whatever I can do to see if I can be stupid enough to get a good picture out of it. So. <laughs> yeah, I've got a yeah, my riding buddy, like I said, Joey Scogan. So we, we ride together and we uh we hype each other up all day and probably end up getting into situations where we shouldn't. Yeah. Uh, we just kind of feed off one another's energy and we have some pretty uh some wild adventures for sure. Nope, absolutely, absolutely. And so your uh your firefighting adventures, your sledding adventures, and uh that over time has also attracted some uh key sponsors for you over the years too, then right? And uh one of the ones yeah. that you just heard this week that uh, you were re-signed on as a fly ambassador again for this this uh, next season. I see the shirt and your hat that you have in the background yeah, I, there. So. Yeah, I brought, brought it with me. <laughs> yep, so congratulations. So, yeah. uh, I got my notice this last week as well, too, that I'm uh, re-signed again for another year. So, uh, you know, good to see you on the team again, I should say. And we'll have to make sure yeah, we uh, uh, figure out a time to get to get together and maybe ride this winter if we can get away with it. So. Yeah, I'm sure we can figure out something. Yeah, it's a pretty uh, unreal feeling. Uh, even, I mean, last winter was when Fly had reached out at that point, uh, was very unsurreal, to be honest. Yeah. Um, so going back on that a little bit, I had met uh, Robert Lawrence uh, before he worked and worked over at Fly West Power Sports. He was working out at uh, Woody's uh, Outdoor Power in Caldwell. Okay. So when I was riding Articat, 
Um, that's where I was doing all my business out there. Uh, I was a great dealer. They supported me a lot, even uh, parts and snowmobiles. If my snowmobile was down, they'd give me a snowmobile. Wow. If I needed a snowmobile for the veterans uh, ride in McCall to go take a veteran around the backcountry, they'd let me take a snowmobile. So it was a very good relationship. And uh, a lot of that was uh, with Robert. So when he left out there and went to fly, mm -hmm. um, that connection, we just stayed connected. And that worked out really well for for me. <laughs> yep, there you go. Now he went over to fly and uh, got you connected with the team over there. And then you've got some other sponsors you wanted to mention as well tonight too, right? Yeah. So in the last, uh, so about two years ago or so, I didn't really have a lot of time to, to ride during the day. Uh, so we started doing a lot of night riding and I got hooked up with uh, Oxbow Adventure Gear, Clayton down in Nevada. Okay. And he makes uh, his like outdoor, basically helmet light, hooks onto your GoPro mount. So started doing a lot of night riding and night filming and uh, got some really cool content out of that and reached out to Clayton. He's been a huge supporter now for the last couple of years. And Oop, I think your camera froze there again. We'll give you a minute to come on back. So for anybody who's... Uh you know, watching the show here right now, so trying to reconnect with uh, with Jack. But for anybody who's watching the show, if you haven't already shared out, this would be a great time to just take a moment and and share the show there out, go. And get it out there. So I got Jack well, we back made, again we now. It, we made it thirty. We made it thirty minutes without it getting cut out there. So that was well. It, it was actually perfect timing. It gave me time for a commercial bait break and remind everybody to share this out again and get into win on their fly racing oh. socks uh, giveaway they're going to get. So yeah, it's almost almost like we planned it. There you go. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so then uh, I'm working out a working out something right now with uh, Dennis Dillon Power Sports. Also, um, we, I started doing a couple projects with him last year. Did my sled build last year. Yeah, uh, we kind of had a just a handshake deal on a couple things, and we got the sled. They used it for uh, their open house down there at Dennis Dillon. They used it at the snow show for display. So we're working on growing that relationship over there. Because uh, when I when I unfortunately when I left to go to Skidoo, um, Woody's Outdoor Power doesn't have Skidoo, so. Okay. I ended up uh, going to a new dealer, and that was a the change from Articat to Skidoo was basically it came down to I went and did a, a demo day in the spring of 2019. Yep. On the 2020 sleds. Is that right? 20? Yeah. Yeah. It's always it's always uh, confusing how they the years right, but yep. So I got hooked up with uh, uh like Tony Jenkins and uh, guys like that on that demo day, and I'm like I'm gonna ride Skidoo. Yeah, it's like the second half the the second half of that demo day was uh, phenomenal. It's like it's time to make that switch. So yeah, yeah. Did you get a chance to uh, demo one of the turbo sleds from last year then or no? I did. Yep. Oh, dude! Like, yep. is that not the most sick sled ever? <laughs> uh, it's, I mean, it, it's just the sound of it. Like, I just want the sound. Ah! <laughs> You just got to get yourself a set of, of earbuds, right? And listen to the turbo sound over and over again. And you could yeah, probably still ride your old Yamaha, right? You know, your old Yamaha um, phaser, right? You could probably still ride that just to have a turbo sound in your ears and you'd be good to go. Man, I tell you, <laughs> yeah, that, the, uh, that sled sounds really good. Yeah, no, I got to demo it a couple times last year too. And I'm, I'm super stoked to uh, get, I, I did snow check one and it's coming in October. And I keep telling myself like, get a job before October, John, get a job before October. Don't give yourself a reason not to pick up that darn sled. So yeah. I'm working, I'm working on it. I'm still doing interviews and all that stuff too. And, uh, you know, just throwing it out there. Anybody out there looking for somebody to do like nothing for a whole bunch of money, let me know. Or if in real seriousness, you have a job and you want me to look at it, hit me up in a PM. I got a lot of cool, uh, cool thick background experience that I can bring to the table for folks. And, uh, it's kind of cool because this whole snowmobiling world thing has kind of almost become a job. I just haven't figured out how to get paid for it yet. But, uh, you know, <laughs> the cool part is we're adding a ton of value, you know, between the avalanche centers, the, uh, you know, airy, for example, um, all kinds of businesses who are getting in line now to sign up to support the airy program. Um, you know, there's some things moving and shaking that we're going to be announcing September 1st. You heard me talking about that a little bit earlier yeah. in the show. So, Yep, I'm I'm super stoked for that, but you know, whoop, whoop, try to keep it on the down low. Yeah, it's gonna uh, be hard to do that. That was, uh, uh, I think that was me all summer long thinking about the new fly onesie suit coming out, <laughs> and uh, and not spoiling, you know, not spoiling it for sure. Exactly, so exactly. Super, super amped up to try that this year for sure. Yep, yep, cool, cool. All right, buddy. So what else we want to talk about tonight? We're about forty minutes into this uh, this rodeo, and uh, we haven't been bucked off the bull yet. So yeah, we've only got disconnected a couple times, but. Yeah, just uh, yes. Yeah, so like I said, I got involved with the uh, with the VA doing their disability ride every year, and I started doing that in t probably 2015. Okay, it's basically uh, a backcountry guide for the day, and it's yep. uh, that's where probably like my passion really started to stem for the sport. 
Yeah. And you start seeing other people's passion in it as well. Right. So yeah. when you show up to an event like that and you have so many dealers, so many businesses, companies and riders that are all showing up to support the disabled vets and to get them out into the back country. Yeah. Uh, that's where I was like, yeah, this is the sport where I'm going to focus my energy. And, yeah. uh, and then going back to Joe Gill, for instance, just learning from him and how he was able, you know, how he's able to network and you can see his passion in everything that he does. Yeah. And it's just like, how do you, how do you try to, how do you try to show that type of passion and you find different ways and. Yep. Um, well, and, jo and Joe Gill has figured out how to be uh, uh, successful in spite of himself, right? Like that's my, oh, yeah, my, 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 that's my joke for Joe Gill. So Joe, I love you. You know, I do. So, oh, he's on. He says, I'm late, but I'm here. He just, he's just oh, checking in now. He must've known we were talking smack about him. <laughs> yeah, here's a ring down there in California. <laughs> yep. Yep. So I actually have a really important question for you, Jack, and it comes from my good buddy, uh, Travis, uh, and Travis, forgive me in advance. I'm going to screw up your last name. Um, it's Ballinger or it's, it's, it's French Canadian. And so like my, my Minnesota yeah. redneck oh, accent quite can't get it right, but let's just call him Travis B right now. But, uh, he says, what is your best advice for men today given the experiences that you've had? And so I know what he's talking about because, uh, Travis is, um, he's a, a motivational speaker. He's somebody who okay. considers himself a, a men's coach. Um, he's somebody that I follow personally and I really appreciate his content. So for anybody who's watching and especially anybody who's impacted by this kind of stuff, um, Travis nails it when it comes to a lot of this kind of content and advice. And I love the fact that he's here watching tonight, cheering us on. Um, but what advice do you have having experienced kind of PTSD, some of the struggles in your life, maybe some of the relationship problems you've had and going through mm -hmm. count, going through counseling and now being on the other side of this, seeing like, oh my gosh, my eyes were opened. What advice do you have for men who might be going through this that haven't pulled that trigger yet? So, yeah. So yeah, a couple things is, uh, is, is don't be scared to ask for help. Amen. Right. That was something I didn't do for a long time. And, uh, looking back now, I'm super grateful I did when I did. Um, the other thing, probably one of the biggest things too, is, is find something that you're passionate about in life. Oh yeah. Right. Find something that you're truly passionate about and, and focus your energy there. Cause if you're focusing all your energy on something like that, you're not going to have the energy to worry about anything else. Yeah. And uh, that's been snowballing for me. Yep. Nope. Absolutely. Yeah. And so it's I mean, it, Aaron McCarthy from the other week, that's a big thing too for him is, you know, like he's he can't work right now like he's technically disabled and he has uh, those uh, seizures that prevents him from being able to right. drive even that kind of thing and so you know he focuses his energy when he can't get out of the house and do anything on woodworking like he's been down there we were building a stool the other day for me and he's building all kinds of other cool decorative type things um but then snowmobiling is a big thing too and like just this ev evolution of getting involved in and then winning this sled and building these relationships in the snowmobile industry like it's it's amazing to watch him kind of come out of his shell and him and I actually this last week we're talking about uh, you know supporting him and helping him kind of kick off a um, it's it's very unofficial yet so but I know he's looking to kick off some kind of a nonprofit organization to tie together these vet veterans ride and the snowmobile community and to allow you know all of these things that you know like what you guys are doing, what Dan Adams is doing, what Paul Thacker is doing, what, you know, the list goes on and on. And there's all kinds of these veteran rides around the country. But what we find is that there's a lot of people and or companies who can and are willing to donate incremental funds into a nonprofit organization and also then benefit from a tax write-off as well while supporting the troops and everything we're trying to do. And so kind of pulling that all together and building those synergies um, is something that Aaron is currently focused on. And I think, you know, Jack, I'd encourage you to reach out to Aaron directly. You know, you can look back at the last post. If you're not already Facebook friends with him, hit him up and, uh, you know, reach out to him. I know he's, it, I spent like two or three hours with him over breakfast talking about this exact topic. So... Yeah, we uh, we connected on Facebook briefly after the uh, so after that episode. So that's awesome. I got to reach out. And, uh, Facebook and social media can be a wonderful thing for that, especially yep, for that nope. networking. So yep, nope, exactly. But, so yeah, uh, like if, you're if you're passionate about something, it doesn't matter where you are. You could be on top of the mountain. You could be in the parking lot. You could yeah. just be driving your truck. There's snowmobiles down the road, and people can tell that you're passionate about it just by the yeah. way you present yourself and represent yourself. Yeah. And the other thing, you know, you saying being willing to ask for help, to me, there's kind of a, a theme there in life in general, right? I think back to all the pro writers that I've had on like Dan Adams and those guys. And the one theme, and we talked about it just recently, again, you heard it on that episode is, you know, if guys will quote unquote, check their ego 
and just open up their mind to learning rather than feeling like they have to be the tough guy and prove to themselves, you know, that they're kind of, you know, this badass kind of person that like, I got this, I got, I can handle it. You know, it's no different in your personal life as it is with your writing, right? Like you can see it over and over again, where if people kind of quote unquote, check their ego, let their guard down and be opening to learn and to get help, whether it be through pro writing, whether it be with counseling, whether it be with relationship advice, whether it be with helping other men out, um, you know, all of those things. And it, frankly, the same goes for women across the way too. Like if we all just kind of allow other people to invest in us and in our lives, like it's always better on the other side, right? Like you've seen it firsthand, right, Jack? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the last couple of years of my life has been, I've, you know, I've turned a, a huge page. Yeah. And uh, I feel like I'm coming out the other side and it's it's been it's been a crazy adventure just in the last two years. Yeah, that's awesome. Before that, you know, I just uh, yeah compartmentalize everything down, and what I would do, what I would do is I would just find myself working all the time. Yeah. And I would work at the firehouse full time. I would work yeah. construction every. You know, I, I was always working. That was the way that I just I kept that buried down. Was focusing on just working. Yeah. So. And based on what you're talking about and what I know our, my friend Travis B. here does is I would highly encourage you and anybody else who's listening to uh, follow Travis and to, to hear his messages he has too because they're super inspirational. And 99.9% and .9 of the time, he's, he's spot on with, with everything he has. And that other 0.1% of the time is because I'm not smart enough to see that he's spot on. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, Travis does good work, so feel free to, to give him a shout out as well, too. But uh, so what do you say? Uh, anything else you want to cover or should we wrap this baby up tonight? Um, but yeah, I think we've kind of hit most everything that we wanted to talk about. That's amazing. I'm sure, so, uh, go I'm ahead. sure we'll think of stuff after the show's over. We're like, yeah, done that. And then, but it's all right. No, well, I mean, if you want to rib Joe a little more, we could do that. He says, Joe, Joe says, I want to know, does he like his do more than the cat? Ooh, I got to tee this up, right? So Joe Gill, who's been writing old iron yeah. M series cats, you know, what is it? Oh, four, five, six, sevens in that range, eight, nines, maybe. What's his newest it one? Maybe goes, It probably goes even further back than that. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. But he's been riding old cats forever. And now Joe Gill's about to sit his butt on a... 850 skidoo i don't even know what size it is to have too but i want to call this out too it's actually a big shout out to the folks who are watching is is uh kyle and nina so uh yeah. d down in california uh, there's some magic deal that they all worked out that got joe convinced to switch over to a skidoo 850 and uh, joe i'll tell you my answer and then i'm gonna turn it over to jack but like i've owned a skidoo m8 m6 whatever too i've had those and for the vintage for the money and for the art they're an amazing sled but night and day difference when you get to a skidoo 850 and the the transition that you you make over there too it's it's an amazing experience you'll love it joe but jack what do you want to add to that yeah so what i'll add to that is it's not only is it going from you know the articat to the skidoo but i mean you look at the advances in technology we have every year now on yep. these sleds and how much they change year to year and then you go from what joe is riding you know the uh with the old m series sleds to the skidoo is going to be a completely different completely different animal in the mat in the mountains Yep. And uh, yeah, my train transition over to Skidoo from Articat was awesome last year. It was phenomenal. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, I think Joe's gonna have a slightly a little bit of a learning curve with the T motion if yeah. he hasn't already locked it out. We'll see if he does or not. Um, yeah, I. It's funny because like I'm personally a fan of the T motion you know, just because of the all around riding I do. Like if I was just hardcore yep. like backcountry, steep and deep, nonstop, I might decide to push over to. But the transition and the easiness of the transition even on a flat, hard surface to be able to roll that skidoo up nice and easy into a side hill maneuver. It's just, it's super buttery. It's nice. It's nice. And then the yeah, other thing. I was, thing, I was like, able to do stuff last year that I would, I would never be able to do on the, my previous slide. So. Yeah. Yeah. And so like, even for me, like I just, even through last year, the last two seasons, I've had a 2019 Skidoo 850, um, 154 Summit X, same as what Kyle is saying Joe's sled's going to be. And I've been riding the Articat Alpha 1 at the same time. And mm -hmm push comes to shove, I ultimately ended up selling the Articat Alpha 1 to another friend who's a big Articat fan. My attitude is that if you're an Articat fan, you love Articats, you'll love the Alpha 1. If you're a two-rail sled person and you've learned how to ride those proficiently, you may not love the Alpha 1. It's kind of what I've learned over time is, uh, you know, it's, it's not that it's worse. It's just so different that bouncing back between the two was just counterintuitive for me. And uh, I could never push myself to the limits i wanted to push myself by bouncing back and forth and so i decided to put all my eggs back in the skidoo basket again so yeah that's what i did same so the winner of what was it 2018 19 
Um, basically, that's I got time on seat time on all the uh, so the Alpha One. I got time on the Polaris and then uh, time on that Skidoo. And uh, yeah, that was the uh, deciding factor was that Skidoo demo day, McCall. And yeah, I'm not going to go back anytime soon, I don't think. Yeah, no, that's awesome. That's awesome. So, so Jack, what does this interview mean to you right now? Like, you've been over in the Middle East for how long? Weeks or months now at this point? Yeah, so it's been months now. And so, months and months, you've been over in the Middle East serving our country dealing with the same guys day in and day out and you've probably been on social media checking out what's going on in the rest of the world and here you are live and in person from the middle east saying hi to all your sled fans out there so what does this interview personally mean to you and 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 what do you want to say to the fans that are out watching uh just uh, definitely thank you for uh, the support i know my mom's probably watching right now for sure awesome um and uh, my girlfriend's probably watching and her daughter and just uh, their support, over, especially over the last couple of years, has been phenomenal. In the last couple of years, the the amount of growth I've had as a person and as a rider. You even threw out the word pro pro rider a few times, which uh, I don't refer to myself as a pro rider, but when you start thinking about it, it's, it's a pretty cool term to hear. So that puts a smile on my face for sure. And uh, yeah, this uh, this whole this whole experience and doing this video is definitely uh, going to be something I'll, I'll never forget, especially doing it from here, right? Doing it from the Middle East. And, yeah. Uh, no, it's going to be a memorable one for me as well, too. Again, it's I, I love the fact that, you know, our shows now are being broadcast literally around the world. Like, I, I mean, I've got fans from Russia and Japan and the Netherlands and all these folks that watch these shows. And even some of the merchandise and merchandise that I've been selling has been being shipped out to Finland, up to Canada, um, different places around the world as well, too. And so to to know that we're spreading this, you know, passion for snowmobiling, the message of safety, education, you know, positive growth of the sport, and we can continue to uh to do so is amazing and so um you know is is leanne simons your mom oh that's my sister your sister okay so your sister yes. says keep moving forward exclamation point very proud of you so yeah and then there's a, a bunch of folks including joe that are all saying you know stay safe uh you know thank you for your service uh you know joe flew out some american flags and the emojis and all that kind of stuff too so we got a lot of passionate people here cheering you on so yeah our time is uh Try not try not to focus on the finish line too much, or else it'll it'll drag out. But we've got a uh, so couple, couple more months, and uh, we should be coming home to snow. Yeah, yeah. So. About the time you get uh, done with your tour of duty, it's time to start riding. So that'll be an awesome time for you to come back. So yeah, so I'm amped. I'm ready. Cool, cool. Well, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up, buddy, but I really appreciate you jumping on tonight for me, in the morning for you. This is technically tomorrow morning for us. Um, yep. right. Like, cause, yep. uh, you're, you're at this point a day ahead of us and, uh, it's in the morning yeah, time, time traveling. time traveling. Right. And so like, it, it's crazy to think we're talking to each other on two different dates, right? That's an amazing concept to me. That's I, I continue to hard, give hard time getting my head wrapped around it, but, uh, you know, really appreciate you being on and for all the viewers who are watching, really appreciate you guys coming on every single week, this show and these guests would, all of us would be nothing without the fans that are out here cheering us on and, being part of all of this so uh you know caitlin inglis says hey jack love you so that must be somebody you know yeah so caitlin inglis is my mom okay perfect i kind of yeah, suspected so one I, of these folks was your mom so that's yeah, awesome i, I need to be on there awesome awesome I'm, so I'm still supposed to, well i told her we facetime this weekend so technically it's still this weekend might be it you, so well this might be it you might have good. checked that box you've been facetiming with her right now the whole time so yeah perfect. There we go. <laughs> awesome so anyway god bless everybody God bless our country, you know, God bless the USA, and uh, don't forget everybody, live large, and if you've forgotten what live large means, it's live life to the fullest, make the most of every day, good days and bad days, every day, make the most of it, and do do service to others, right, like help others out, and you know, Jack, I think you fit the bill on all those, buddy, like you're living life to the fullest, you're making the most of every day, whether you're in the Middle East here on our show, or if you're out here riding and, and shredding hard, you're making the most of it and you're definitely serving the rest of us. And so you're helping others. I appreciate you, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. Have a great night. Awesome. Thank you very much for the opportunity.